I am excited to begin this series on hope. I'm grateful for those who inquired about hope. This series is indeed a response, if you did not know, to an inquiry from a member that asked the question, where is the hope in our faith? In the midst of so much trouble and violence, chaos and confusion, there was a request, maybe multiple requests, that we spend some time focusing on hope. What a blessing to be asked to concentrate on hope. Thank you for those, to those who inquired. Your inquiry was actually an act of hope. And for the next 10 weeks, we will concentrate on hope. Don't miss it. My prayer is that our collective meditation and concentration on hope does not disappoint, as the text says, but that it accomplishes the purpose for which God is speaking into our lives at this time, and that it leaves us with more hope than when we began. I wonder if today's scripture the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Romans that you just read and heard several times arose from a similar collective yearning for a word of hope. After all, there were conditions that inspired Paul to write this letter to all God's beloved in Rome, which is how he refers to them in the opening of the letter. And let's remember that the epistles of Paul are just that. They are letters. He wrote to followers of Christ, some Jewish converts, some Gentiles, some in churches he planted, off others to churches he heard about and wanted to visit. That is the case here with Romans. He heard about particular Christians in Rome to whom he wrote this letter. In Romans 1, 8, Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. Paul wanted to visit them because the news of what was happening in Rome had traveled, as Paul said, throughout the world, as expansive as the world seemed at that time. Paul's letter to the Romans, considered by many biblical scholars, to be a catalyst for reform and renewal of Christian faith and life is a response to what was happening in Rome among people of faith at the time. There were religious tensions in Rome between Jews and those who believed in Jesus and those who didn't and with Gentile Christians. And amidst the religious tensions, society was also quite troubled. And we get first hints of this trouble in chapter 1, verse 8, when Paul refers to ungodliness and injustice. And then we get more than a hint as Paul runs down some of the trouble in Rome, at least from his perspective in verse 29 of chapter 1, that those who do not acknowledge God were filled with every kind of injustice, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, craftiness. They are gossips, Paul says, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious toward parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Paul didn't miss <laughs> words in describing what he had heard was happening in Rome. And those words, you could have closed your eyes and imagined that he's describing our society. Paul's letter is indeed a response to an inquiry of sorts for hope in a hopeless situation. So today on this first of a series of hope, the Apostle Paul's words to God's beloved in Rome, I pray they speak to God's beloved of Hyde Park Union Church and beyond. Let's go to our text today. My prayer is that you keep it open in front of you as we walk through it together. Paul, after a long theological and Christological discourse in the previous chapters, 
to address the religious tension. If you read that, you can tell that he's trying to address all of that religious tension that is going on. Paul gives this short pericope that is our scripture today on what I call the halves. Sometimes when you're in search of hope, you have to look at what you have. Not material halves, but spiritual halves. And Paul comes to this place in his letter where he lifts up several spiritual halves of our faith from which we can draw hope. The first half, Paul says in verse 1, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first half that we have is peace with God through faith in Jesus. Paul says we've been justified by faith. In other words, there was a separation between humanity and God through our faith. There's been reconciliation between humanity and God. That basically means we're all right with God. There's an assurance that each and every one of you can have and should have, and that is that God loves you, God cares for you. You can have peace when it comes to your relationship with God. We know how difficult relationships can be. Paul's saying you don't have to worry about your relationship with God. You're good. That might sound basic to you, but there are those who do not have that assurance. There are those who wonder about the love of God, those who think no one loves them, especially not God. There are those who think they've done so much wrong that God surely has given up on them. And then there are those who just simply can't comprehend what it means to have peace with God. Paul says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may not be perfect, we may not dot all our I's or cross all our T's, but our relationship with the Creator is one relationship we don't have to worry about. That in the midst of so much turmoil, we can find peace and security in our relationship with God and in the knowledge that God will never leave us nor forsake us, that God is aware of us, that God cares for us, that God knows us by name. There's a song by an artist named Tasha Cobb. The lyrics go like this, and she uses he as the pronoun for God. Listen to the lyrics. I'm not going to sing this morning, y'all. But the lyrics say... He knows my name. Yes, he knows my name. He knows my name. Yes, he knows my name. Oh, how he walks with me. And oh, how he talks with me. And oh, how he tells me that I am his own. Then she turns it around, as we saw in the Psalms a couple of weeks ago, and then she talks to God, and she says, you know my name. You know my name. Oh, how you comfort me. Oh, how you counsel me. Yet it still amazes me that I am your friend. I was visiting a church one day recently and the praise team sang this at the end of service. I went outside after service and was talking to a friend and a senior gentleman, I'd say he was well into his 80s, was walking past me, walking to his car alone, and he was still singing this, you know my name, you know my name. Oh, how you walk with me. Oh, how you talk with me. It was precious. And, and I could tell that the sentiment, more than the song, had blessed him so. Is there more hope than the hope that can come from knowing that the divine knows you? 
and loves you and walks with you and talks with you and never leaves you alone, that when the world gets wild and crazy, and it will, there is nothing new under the sun, you can rest and sure that you're never left alone and that God knows your name. Psalm, the psalmist of Psalm 27 says, For in the day of trouble, God will keep me safe in God's dwelling. God will hide me under the shelter of the sacred tent and set me high up upon a rock. Like the, the water is raging underneath, but God has set you upon a rock. Are you looking for hope in the midst of trouble? Our faith is a faith that leads us to a relationship with God that no one has to construct for us, but one that we can experience on our own and, that, and a relationship that can be a source of peace and a source of comfort and hope in the time of trouble. That brings me to the second half. Listen as Paul continues his statement, he says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access. Say access. Thank you. The first half is that we have peace with God, and that's wonderful. But the second half that Paul lifts up is just as profound as having peace with God, and that's having access to God. Have you ever had access? to a backstage of a concert? <laughs> Have you ever had access to the highest person in the company? Ever had access to the highest office in the land? Some of you did since he used to live right down the street. <laughs> access is special, access is liberating, and access is power. Well, Paul says we have access to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says access to grace, and this comes all together with it. In other words, we don't have to have a special collar to connect with the divine. We don't need a special education to get time with God, that we don't need an intermediary to hear from the Lord. Paul says we have access, and you can believe those were radical thoughts and words in those days and even radical in these days, depending on the faith you practice. And what good is access if you don't use it? Access is only helpful when you use it. If the alderman lived next door and your basement kept flooding, you use your access. If the mayor lived next door and noise outside was keeping you up all summer, you know they were doing those circles in the middle of your intersection at three in the morning and the mayor lived next door, how many would use your access? When the president lived down the street and you saw him at Valois restaurant and you had a chance whether you took it or not, you had a chance to use your access. Access is only good when you use it. And is there any greater hope than the hope that comes when you realize you have access? and you start to use it. And see, you know what happens is when you start to use it and it delivers, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna use it again. Oh, I called the alderman and they fixed it? Oh, the alderman gonna hear from me again. Access means you don't need any special credentials. Access means you don't need special titles or appointments with the clergy. Not to talk to God, you don't. Access means God's never too busy to take your call. So here's my question to you. Are you using your access? The hymn writer said it this way. Is your all on the altar? Your heart does the spirit 
control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as we yield our body and soul. Use your access. There are things we carry that we need to place on the altar. We should have placed it on the altar a long time ago. How is your prayer life? We have spiritual tools that we don't use enough, access that we don't tap. We're looking for hope in all the wrong places. When what we need is a prioritized prayer life. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 6, and when you pray, after he just told them to pray, go into your room, shut the door. See, Jesus knew that humans had this propensity sometimes to do things for show or, or that that would stop them if they had to do it out loud in front of others. They'd be too afraid. And Jesus said, you don't have to worry about any of that. Go in your closet. Shut the door and pray and use your access. If you can't tell, I sincerely believe in the power of prayer. I've seen God answer my prayers and other people's prayers. When I worry, it might take me a little bit, but it won't take me long before I commit it to prayer. Otherwise, I would have lost all my hair by now. And when I pray, I listen, and I wait, and I observe, and I anticipate and expect that God is going to begin to move. And as sure as I'm standing here, because I wouldn't be standing here, God moves. Might not be like I wanted it. Might not be when I wanted it might not be what I want, but I've seen God move. If you're struggling with hope in these days of uncertainty, I encourage you to prioritize prayer. Use your access and you'll find peace. That's also Paul in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, which means laying on your face and prayer, giving it all to God. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And then Paul says, and then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That means that you'll have peace when you really shouldn't and people will go, whoa, she has peace in the midst of that storm. You used your access. There is hope in the hands. Not only do we have peace with God and we have access to God, but we also have history with problems. Look at verse 3. Paul says, and not only that, but we also boast in our afflictions, knowing that affliction, oh, I just heard that all over, hope, knowing, somebody underlined knowing, knowing that affliction produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. This is one of those scriptures from Paul that has been used in terribly wrong ways. Hear me good. We cannot and should not use this scripture to justify the suffering of others. Oh, well, yes, they are poor, or yes, they are struggling, or yes, they are on the underbelly of our society, but the Bible says that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. No. Do not do that. That is wrong. It is harmful. And this scripture is taken out of context and is a major part of the problem in our faith. 
So then it's clear, here is my remix to Paul's point. And that is that we all have history with at least one problem. If you've had at least one problem, say amen. amen. <laughs> and at least one problem that we didn't think we'd survive. We have history with that problem that we thought would take us out. We have history with that issue, that affliction, that diagnosis, that unemployment, that concern that kept us up at night. That we didn't think we'd survive with our sanity. But when we look back over our lives and over that situation, we can not only see that we survived, but we can see that it produced something in us that has made us stronger and to use Paul's words to increase our endurance. It developed character and it eventually and ultimately increased our hope. And sometimes when we feel hopeless, we need to realize that among our haves is the reality that we have a history with problems that we've overcome. Say, say amen somebody, I know I'm preaching now problems that we once thought would take us out but we're still here Amen. and that we can indeed gain hope in the midst of new problems knowing that that one we thought would take us out is way in our history and we're still here to tell about it in his second letter to the Corinthians Paul gives his testimony in chapter 12 verse 7 he says I was given a thorn in my flesh to keep me from being conceited. That's another sermon for another day, Pastor Sarah. A messenger of Satan, he says, to torment me. Something was really hurting Paul, physically and spiritually and mentally. Three times, he said, I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. He, he goes on and he says, for when I am weak, Paul says, then I am strong. Paul has history with the thorn in his flesh that tormented him and he used his access, cried out to God and he received not an immediate healing, but he received God's response. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul's problem, his thorn in the flesh, increased his endurance. It developed his character, and it increased his hope. God's response changed his perspective and changed his life. And that response has blessed people from that time until now and beyond. You see, sometimes we too often are looking for the material, the change that can, voila, appear before our eyes. And when we, when we need to receive the spiritual, Sometimes we want the natural when we need to learn to sense the supernatural. So the greatest lesson here is that Paul received from God a divine message in the midst of his torment that changed his perspective, changed his life, and gave him hope, period. See, we've got to come to the point where we can accept that sometimes it won't be that natural change. There is something going on in the spiritual. Can we grow spiritually such that hearing from the divine is more than enough? And it's greater than any miracle we asked for. Lord, help us. Paul gives us spiritual nourishment today with the haves. First, we have peace with God. We have access to God. We have history with afflictions that give us hope. And then the last verse, and I'm almost done, is full of haves. Verse 5. For after receiving hope from our history with problems, Paul reminds us of three other haves. Let's, let's look at verse 5. He says, and hope does not put us to shame, 
Another version says, hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You may not see three, maybe you see two halves. Here are the last three halves of the pericope. We have God's love in our hearts. We have the Holy Spirit. And here's my favorite one, we have each other. Paul says that God's love has been poured into our hearts, collective, community, and that the Holy Spirit has been given to who? To us. And when we come to understand that our faith is best lived out in community, that no man is an island, that we walk this journey alone, when we as a church, Hyde Park Union Church, find things to do together, when we act together with God's love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, we can do much good together. For we have God's love in our hearts and God's love is there to be shared with others. We have the Holy Spirit who will lead us and guide us into all righteousness. In other words, will guide us to the good we can do with God's love in our hearts. And when we really come to value that we have each other, we can do our part in making this world a better place. Not sure what to do, Jesus' words in Matthew 25 are always a good starting point. Jesus says, so when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, and I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. Anybody know there's some strangers that have come to the community? Strangers, according to what I know Jesus means, you invited me in. Imagine that. I needed clothes, Jesus said, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison. They're not that far away, y'all. And you came to visit me. Then the righteous said, and that's us, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see the stranger and invite you in and needed clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick? or in prison and go to visit. And, and the king replied, this is actually a parable, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these you did for me, and I believe one of the keys to a life full of hope is a life full of service. There are needs right here in our community waiting for us to address together. There will be appeals made there have been appeals made. There will be more appeals made to which you can respond that allow us to work together to help someone other than ourselves. In the air, it's the area of growth needed in our church at this moment more than anything. And when we realize what we have, we have the peace of God, we have access, we have history with problems, we are indeed survivors. When we realize that we have the love of God, we have the Holy Spirit, we have each other, we will come to realize that we are uniquely qualified to serve those in need. And if and when we work together to serve those in need, our life of service will lead to a life full of hope will lead to a life of service, will lead to a life of hope, and so on, and so on. God bless you.